What is up, guys? Alex here. Welcome back to the Annika Creates podcast. It's so nice of you to join me here again this week for a new episode. Today, we're going to be talking about mix notes. And this is something I come across a lot as a mixer. And uh, I have to get mix notes from many different things, uh, from many different people, from many different situations. I've seen many mix notes come in. I've had to deal with mix notes a lot. And this kind of applies, frankly, to a lot of different creative notes. And this is kind of a follow up, frankly, to my uh, episode 66. I did an episode uh, about the best ways to give mix notes and to give feedback or not even, it wasn't about specifically mix notes. It was more about feedback. Um, when somebody asks you, what do you think of their mix or of the production or anything like that? And as a creator, as a, as an artist, how do you give feedback to a producer who's working on your track? But this, this time I wanted to specifically talk about mix notes themselves and whether you're on the receiving end of that as a mixer, here's some things that if you're new in mixing, if you're coming up as an engineer, engineer as a mixer, what to kind of expect, or what you should expect, and what we kind of want to see in this landscape. And if you're a creator, if you're a artist, and you are working on a track and you have notes to give your mixer, some guidelines for that. And so it kind of goes on both ways, and I'm probably going to intermingle or, or go back and forth between uh, you know who each note is pointed towards and fits best towards. But I think all of it is going to be good for anybody in, involved in this to take in. So now I will say right off the top that this kind of more applies to dealing with a more professional mixer. The less of a professional mixer you're getting, the more or the less, I guess, that this is going to apply. Um, because, you know, your buddy who's doing it for you for fun for 25 bucks is not going to be the same level of respect and not going to be the same level of professionality as you expect from somebody. You're paying a couple hundred dollars to $500 to upwards of $500 for a song, for a mix. Um, when it comes to that, when you're dealing with a full-time professional, you kind of have to start trusting what they're doing and you kind of have to start thinking, well, they obviously did this for a, a reason. And I'm not saying don't question anything anybody does. You should absolutely question. If you don't agree with something, you should absolutely question it. And it is at the end of the day, if you're an artist, it is absolutely your track. However, if you're dealing with a professional mixer, here are some guidelines to deal with that. And if you are an artist and want to be taken professionally, here are some things to uh, take into consideration and to kind of realize about this process. Now, I will say these are more guidelines than hard and fast rules because some of them, uh, some of them are more hard and fast rules, I guess you could say, but some of them are more guidelines uh, that I think should be respected for everybody's time and everybody involved in the project. And I'll kind of explain a little bit about why that is, but everybody's creative process is different. Everybody's process and timeline and uh, what they're dealing with in their life, what they're dealing with with the project, what the everybody involved is doing, the timeline of the project, all that kind of stuff is going to differ. Uh, that's just the way it is. So like I said, not all of this is hard and fast rules. You have to kind of take this with a grain of salt and take it into fit within your parameters. But these are good guidelines uh, that I've seen and, and stuff like that. So we're just talking about mixed notes. That's why I came up with the idea, let's just talk about mixed notes because I feel that there are a lot of misconceptions. A lot of artists don't know if they're supposed to give mixed notes, if they're not, what the, what the deal is. So anyway, so first off, to answer that exact question is if you like a mix, you're good. That's why you hired somebody. That's why they are doing the mixing, not you. They are professionals. So if you get a mix back and you are like, this is perfect. I literally don't know what to say. That's okay. Tell them you love it. You're good. I love people who just, uh, obviously when I'm a mixer and I get it right, I love it. But I really respect when somebody can actually say that and can actually go, I love this. I have no notes. Um, if you have no notes, you have no notes. You don't have to kind try and come up with some notes just for the sake of having notes. It's that is not what is needed. <laughs> you know what I mean? So don't worry about that. If you find yourself not having notes, that is, that's great. Don't try and come up with stuff. I really, it's really annoying when you have something and it's like, oh, they're really just trying to put their two cents in, um, by not having notes. And if you're an executive, this happens a lot with executive producers or somebody like that, where they want their little stamp on it. They want to have their say in it, but they've had their say in it the whole time. And if you're an artist, you've had your say in it the whole time. You don't need to have your say in the mix. The mix presented itself because of it was your song and your production that you did with the song or you were involved in the production and all the little things along the way and what the mixer talked to you about before actually starting to mix all those things played a factor in the mix itself so be happy that it worked out and you didn't need to do any notes <laughs> you know what i mean i see too often that people just try and 
try and stick that extra two cents in and it's it uh, it just ends up hurting the mix and the relationship frankly in general so um yeah to answer that question that i do get a lot is do i really do i need mix notes am i supposed to have them? you don't you're not you don't need them you don't need them if you hired the right guy and you're paying a thousand dollars for a mix or five hundred dollars for a mix or two hundred dollars for a mix whatever you're paying for a mix um and you have no notes and you're thinking this is expensive. I should have notes. No, you're paying for them to not need to go back and forth with notes, frankly. Um, so, you know, just a, a word uh, to the wise there. You don't have to force notes out of everything. So general thoughts uh, and, and some pointers here. So we're just going to go through the list. They're in no particular order, frankly. I just thought of these things that would be good as notes about mixed notes. So first off, in my opinion, and this is different mixers think differently, but mixed notes shouldn't take more than, let's say, two weeks. And getting back, and, and this, again, plays into the timeline of the project, plays into the timeline of people's lives. If you're doing this as a part-time thing and your mixer's doing this as a part-time thing and they're kind of mixing on weekends, okay, fine, That's gonna it's going to take longer than two weeks just by the nature of that. But I've done a, a few records that th th this process takes way longer than it should, and somebody has to listen to the mix for a while. And the longer they listen to the mix is, pro is probably a problem, and they, they are trying to find something to say. If it's not, the, the best mixes are ones that are turned around within a day or two, um, like the mix notes, where you give the mix and they give you notes within a day. Often some of my best, like the producers that I work with, they'll have mix notes within an hour. They literally listen to it a couple times and go, yeah, this is what's standing out, this is what's not. And then they move on. You don't need to overthink it. And, and when things are taking too long, you have to sit on it for a week. That's a problem, frankly. Um, that is that's you trying to think of things and and trying to come up with stuff to say. And I really think that a lot of people get too in their head when it comes to that. Um, I've done a project before, uh, and this is one of the worst, where it took literally like six months between mix notes. So I'd send them a mix, and then six months later, they'd get back to mix notes. Now, there, that's a problem. That is a, a big problem, and it, and it uh, you know, it was six months was the longest one, but they would literally average was about a month or two uh and it took almost a year to finish the mixes which by the end i told them you guys can't do this anymore i i, I got really fed up with that um but i didn't have it in a contract i didn't have it in anything and as a mixer i, I realized that's where i learned that that's what you have to do and put it in put it in writing this is your kind of your timeline so that you have that safety built in there but the problem with taking too long to do a mix even if you're doing a part-time even if you're doing it that kind of thing if it's taking longer than two weeks if it's taking longer than a month frankly the problem is is that you're now listening to the song and you are a different person you have different creative ideas and this was what happened with this mix that i did with over over six months or more was that they came back with mix notes. They said, "Now, no, we've been practicing this, and and now we use an octave pedal in this section. Could could we add that in the mix?" It's like, no, 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 no. We recorded it without an octave pedal. We recorded it because I I produced the, the the track as well, and I, we did not do that or engineered it. And I was like, we didn't do that in the in the recording session. I'm not adding it as a mix note six months later because you you got a new octave or pedal and now you're using it. That's not the point. You're changing creatively if you take too long. I really believe in getting it, your gut instinct, the way that you're feeling about a track as you're doing it. That is the most important thing because that is your creative, the, the creative world you're living in as you're creating the track. A, a, a song is a snapshot in time in your life. And some bands, yeah, they can take a month or a, or a year to make a record. That's still a snapshot of that year. They don't really revisit it a year after they made the record before putting it. It just doesn't work. Um, so especially as a small artist, when you can turn things around faster or whatever, uh, because you don't have as much, um, I guess, public pressure, so to speak, like big bands, they take a while because they have to make, it's like, well, we have a bunch of number ones. We need to, you know, follow that up with another number one. It's a little more pressure, uh, in that sense. But anyway, you're, you're capturing a snapshot. So yes, we could keep going. We could keep changing stuff. We could redo the vocals and then the guitar player is better. So we redo the guitar and then the drummer's better and they redo the drums, then the vocalist is like, well, I changed some melodies and I've improved as a vocalist because I've been taking vocal lessons. Let's redo the vocals. And you get into this perpetual cycle of new things that you found. And as, and as a mixer, you found new plugins. You're using new effects. You're using new approaches. You have to move on. You really do have to move on. And frankly, all the things that you're doing after after the first two weeks, after the first a, a couple initial notes 
are so trivial that no one's ever going to notice besides you that know it's there. <laughs> okay. Um, so even sometimes I've, I know as a mixer, there's, there's times where I do a note and I'm like, I can barely hear this and I'm doing the note and they're like, Oh, this is way better. It's, it, it's, it's all a mind game at that point. So you have to remind yourself basically that notes shouldn't take s- super long. Um, when you're doing a mix, that should be your number one priority in a sense. And you should get notes turned around fast. Listen to it for a day. I have no problem with sending a mix and getting notes back the next day or a day later if people work during the day, that kind of thing. But it should be your number one priority. You shouldn't be, you know, when you're in that part of making music, that should be number one. You need to finish that mix. You need to get that done. If you're an artist, when you get a mix, make it a priority to sit down for half an hour and listen to the mix and make your notes. That's uh, that's all it needs. You don't need to listen to it for a day on and off. You need to just sit down, listen to it, make your initial notes, listen to it again, just think about it, and then pass the notes on and be done. That's, frankly, you know, it shouldn't take that long. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, so so that's first one is mixed notes shouldn't take more than two weeks, frankly, I don't think. Uh, but they shouldn't take long, essentially. The next note is that I have is listen in listening environments that you know. Um, I hear this a lot with smaller bands where they're like, oh, I'm going to go to my buddy's place and he has a really nice stereo. I'm going to go listen to it there to get a really good perspective. Here's the thing. If you listen to mixes, if you listen to music, not even mixes, if you listen to music in general, if you listen to music all the time while you're walking with your AirPods, that is probably one of the best ways to listen to a mix to get your initial impact notes on the mix. Yes, you should check it out in different places. I'm not saying you shouldn't, but don't go to your buddy's Tesla to listen to it because they've got good sound systems. If you don't, if you've never listened to songs, music at all in that car, okay, that doesn't make sense. Don't, if you, you know, don't go to environments that you don't know. Use your AirPods. They're great. If you listen to hours upon hours of music on them, they're phenomenal. Um, use, use the stereo in your house, whatever stereo you listen to stuff on. If you are a Sonos user, you listen to it through your Sonos speaker. Uh, if you, whatever car you drive to work in, put it on on your way to work or on your way to the grocery store or whatever and listen to how it is. Because you know those environments. Subconsciously, you know those environments. And changing the environment super drastically doesn't make any sense. I know a lot of really professional bands that they're in the studio. They know the studio well enough so they can make some decisions. But they do their notes. They they kind of they work on the stuff in the studio with the mixer. And then they take it home for the night to listen on their AirPods in their car on the way home and on their stereo system at home that they know. And then they come back with their init- their notes from there. And then they can build on it in the studio with the because they can understand the speakers well enough. Um, but that's what they, that's all they do. And that's okay. I want, I, I'm not saying don't listen to it on anything else besides the studio monitors that are great, but it's very valuable to listen to it on your AirPods that you already know. And it's very valuable. I, I personally, as a mixer, um, I don't really drive a ton. Uh, so I, a car check isn't really a, a hugely, um, a beneficial thing that I do all the time because I just don't know the car as well as some people do. Some people know it really, really well. And that's a car check is exactly that checking it in a different environment, a weirder environment than perfectly centered studio monitors. Right. But I love, I go for walks with my AirPods all the time. So I listen to mixes. I go for a walk and listen to the, my mixes on my AirPods. That's a check that I have. And that shows so much stuff that's wrong or, or right with my mix. And that's really, really important. So, um, so listen on environments that you know, and don't try and go and listen to every single environment you can think of in everybody's house and everybody's car. It's no, no, no. You're just going to confuse yourself because on one set of speakers, it's going to sound this way. And on one set of speakers, it's going to sound that way. And when you're really intently listening to it, you'll notice that you won't notice otherwise. People are not going to notice. It's going to be like, oh yeah, there's more vocals. They know their environment's better. They're like, yeah, it's the vocals are really loud in this one. If they're even paying attention to that, so you know, uh, listen environments that you know, and 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 listen on your headphones that you're comfortable with. Pick a couple places to listen, and that's where you make your notes. That's where you listen, and that's where you kind of double do your double checks. Um, double checks are good, but. Just, you know, that's what you have to do. You don't need to uh, check it in 10 different places, okay, (laughs) to pick the one or two that you know really well. Next is don't bring too many cooks in the kitchen. And what I mean by this is everybody that's involved has a different creative opinion, okay? The mixer has a creative opinion. The producer has a creative opinion. The band has a creative opinion. Uh, You as an artist, the main, the lead vocalist has an opinion versus the bass player who has a different opinion versus the drummer who has a different opinion. Everybody has different opinions. And 
when you that's hard enough to manage everybody that's involved but then when you start getting other people and trying to get other people your your girlfriend everybody in the band's girlfriend also has an opinion uh or boyfriend has an opinion and then you bring in your mothers and your fathers and your your best friend and whatever i'm not saying don't ask people about their thoughts but understand that one they don't know what they're talking about so they are not in this creative process so just because they say something doesn't mean it's right um take it with a grain of salt take it into consideration if they point something out but don't that's not a mixed note that you should give to the mixer because johnny said my buddy johnny said that the the drums need to come up and they need to take over the whole mix that doesn't mean that that's how you feel. You need to know how you feel. Um, and bringing too many cooks into the kitchen by, by asking too many people for, for their opinion, it's kind of the same thing as double checking your mix on too many speakers. You start to get confused. Do I listen to my mom who says that the vocals are too loud? Or do I listen to my buddy Johnny who says that he can't hear any of the words? Which one do I pay attention to? Well, exactly you see what i mean what do you feel do you feel it sounds good then that's what you should you need to go with um mixers don't mix uh, good ones at least uh your buddy who does it for 25 bucks maybe different story but good mixers are not going to mix your vocals so that nobody can hear it they're not uh, and if they they do there's a creative decision but behind it frankly but you have to trust that the mixer knows what he's doing so so some of the fundamental things just trust, if you're not sure, trust that they know what they're doing. And and mixers are the track record who bands have worked with and who have good mixes and who you like their mixes. If you don't know, you can probably trust that they know what they're doing. Um, that being said, if you have a concern, raise your concern. If they, if you really do feel that they mix the vocal too low, absolutely say something. Uh, because everybody's human. They all make mistakes or they all try are trying something different or hear it in a different way. But that goes back. Uh, but but basically, my point is is don't try and involve too many people in getting too many creative decisions on the same thing. Uh, it's it's just not going to work. It's not worth it. Your buddy Johnny, I guarantee, will like the song when he when you put it out, whether he had a say in it or not. So, uh, you know, don't confuse yourself. Just put it out and he'll love it. He'll be like, oh, this is great. People like that, people who aren't really involved, will have an opinion for the sole purpose of having an opinion wanting to be involved. So by opening it up to that, you're opening it up to very bad opinions by people who don't know what they're talking about. Okay. So yeah, just keep that in mind. Um, next, it, which kind of goes along with this, especially if you're a band, this is a big one for bands is consolidate your mix notes, consolidate your mix notes, talk amongst yourselves as a band and put all your mix notes together, then send them the mixer as a mixer, getting mix notes in emails from five different band members all of them contradicting each other. I'm just going to send you the same mix and go, here you go. And everybody's going to think that I did what they wanted, but it all balanced out because the drummer's going to want the drums lou louder. The vocalist's going to want the vocals louder. The guitar player's going to want the solo louder. And the, you know, the rhythm guitar player's going to want the solo quieter. Everybody is going to, you know, it's all going to contradict. So, as a band, you have to hash that out first before sending that to the mixer. Or the mixer is going to be going, you're going to be going in circles. And then, of course, it's going to take you longer than two weeks to do the, to do mix notes. But consolidate your notes. A band, work together, sit down together, listen to the mixes together. Everybody kind of put their opinions together, sit down together, and then uh, hash out your ideas together. Um, and then, you know, discuss what do you think's best? What don't you think? Whatever. And then send the final version of all your mix notes in one mix through one communicator, uh, and send that to the mixer. And that is going to, that's going to, going to solve a lot of problems because you guys have already hashed it out. You guys already know what's going to happen. And the notes aren't contradicting each other, which mean, leaves the mixer in like, a, well, what the hell do I do? Uh, you know, one guy likes this, but the other guy wants that change. Same thing changed. Well, then what do I do? And and it's not the job of the mixer to try and mediate that. That is you as a band member. That's part of what you have to do. So, um, and, and mixers, I encourage you to tell bands, if they all send you mix notes, I encourage you to put them all together in one email and send it back and go, you guys need to figure this out because half of you guys are contradicting each other. You guys need to talk. You are a band, talk to each other and figure it out. <laughs> you know? Um, so yeah, consolidate your notes. The next one, uh, which I kind of already talked about, I guess, is if you have questions for your miss, if you have questions on why your mixer did something, ask them. Uh, and what I'm, what I mentioned before is if you think they did something wrong or you think that something's odd, like the vocals, not loud enough or whatever, question them. Absolutely question them. And if you, 
here's something strange that they did or creative decision that they did. Ask them, why did you do that? What's the point? And don't, don't yell at them. Don't, don't uh, attack them about it. Ask them. And because often mixers do stuff for different reasons and they have a purpose behind it to build the song. They're thinking of the song as a whole. They're thinking of all of the elements in the mix as a whole versus you, who is uh, the vocalist, very concentrated on the vocal itself and wanting to hear your crystal clean vocal the whole time. Whereas they might have done a, a megaphone effect or something on part of it and they have a creative reason for doing that. If you don't understand it, that's okay. Ask them about it. Find out. Because sometimes, and I've often found this, if people ask me, why did you do this mixed decision? I will come back to them and go, well, this is why I did it. And this is what it helps with. And this is how it works in the context of the whole song and blah, 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 blah. And they often go, oh, great. I love it. That's awesome. That sounds great then. And that explanation can go a long way into you appreciating a note more or, or, or a creative move more as an artist. And uh, it just helps um, deal with it because sometimes they, they maybe don't have a reason and you're like, well, I don't really like it. And they're like, well, okay, cool. I was just trying to do something. And then you guys can go, well, okay, if you want to do something, how about this? And then you'll come up with different ideas. So communication is key in that, in that way. Um, but yeah, if you're not sure, ask, ask your mixer about stuff, ask them, um, so that you're not, you're not battling this and, and you, you know, they're doing something that you might not realize you need and you don't understand it yet, but you will. Um, so if there's something you don't understand, ask. That's a, a important one in communication. Next is, this is more of a note, uh, and that is that you are hiring a mixer for their creativity. Uh, a good mixer for their creativity. More than just their technical knowledge, you're also wanting them for their creative decisions. So let them be creative. Let them do the creative decisions you are hiring them for. Um, yes, any good mixer who's worth their worth the money that you're spending. And if you are, are if you're, as long as it's not your buddy for 25 bucks, <laughs> but a good mixer who you're paying $500 or more for, they are, they're good at what they do. Technically, they're good at what they do. They know how to use EQ. They know how to use compression. They know how to mix in that sense. So don't, you don't have to like handhold them through that process and go, oh, the, the vocal needs to be a louder on top of the, on top of the track so that we can hear all the words. They know you need to hear the words. It's a pop song. Okay. That's, they understand that, <laughs> but you want to let them go with their creative decisions and see what they do. If you, if you burden them with too many notes right off the top, this is what I want. This is what I want. This is what I want. You're not really letting them do their thing. And the more notes you give them about your own creative decisions and your own creative stuff that you 100% want, even if you don't really know, um, obviously if you know you want something, you absolutely tell them. But uh, I, I find often that people don't really know what they want. So they think they need to give a bunch of notes before the mix. And then that hand that it hand ties the mixer basically. And the more notes that a mixer has from you that they're, they feel more and more hand tied and they can't do anything, the less and less they'll try to do anyway, because they're like, well, this person is very specific, exactly what they want. The problem is that that person who's trying to be very specific doesn't actually know what they want. <laughs> they're just trying to sound like they know what they're talking about. So if you don't know, don't try and sound smarter than you actually are and just let the mixer do their thing. You're hiring them, like I said, you're hiring them for their creativity uh, and what they're going to do to the mix, how they interpret the song. So let them do that. And, you know, you're, you're, you're not hiring somebody purely for their name. You're hiring them for their creative decisions. You know, you're not going to hire CLA is a great mixer. I love his, his mixes. He's, he's great, but you're not going to hire him to do some ethereal atmospheric record he's a pop or he's a rock guy i should say not pop but um pop rock i guess too but he has big punchy drums and rock stuff that's his that's his niche that's what people really love from him um and that's where he seems to go but you're not going to hire him to do something that's got no drums and no guitars in it as quickly as you're going to hire somebody else that does that you know what i mean so that's what I mean. His creative decisions and his decisions as a mixer are more in that vein. So if you're hiring somebody for your atmospheric track and you hire somebody that's an atmospheric -y style of mixer or somebody who you think can do that based on their previous work, uh, then let them do their thing. Okay. Um, and, and many mixers, I'm, I'm, I'm not saying mixers have their exactly their niches. Lots of mixers bring different things to different, uh, many different genres, myself included, but, um, 
you know, let them be creative, let them see, and then you can dial it back. And, and, you know, I often find that the first mix is there's a lot of my choices in there and the mixers, it's their choices and their things. And then it starts to dial back with a, a round or two of mix notes where the band goes, I really don't like what you did there, but I love what you did here. And I love what you did there. So then they dial back the one or two things that the mixer went, uh, their own direction that the band doesn't really like. And that's natural. That's normal. Um, you're going to have that all the time. It's different creative opinions. So, uh, um, that's good. That is good to have. So don't worry about that, but let the mixer try some stuff because you're going to find, like I said, you're going to find things that you didn't know you needed. <laughs> okay. Um, or that you didn't realize uh, that they're going to try and they're going to do, and you're going to love it or you're not. And then you go from there. So, uh, yeah, let the creator, let the, the mixer do the creative decisions because that's, that's what you're hiring them for, frankly. So next, Beware of demoitis. Okay, this is a very important one because often people uh, record a song and then they have kind of the rough mix or the the version that they printed or whatever, and they listen to that nonstop when they finish making a record, but they don't get the mix back for a month. Uh, by then, they're so um, used to the demo mix or the or the uh, rough mix or whatever that everything is basically just trying to be that, and that's a really really hard place for a mixer to be because no matter what they do, it doesn't sound like the other one. Uh, so they're up that they, like they can't clean it up, and make it sound more professional. Yet the artist who is trapped in this doesn't realize that when they say make it more professional and then they say, well, I don't like what you did there. That's the thing that's making it sound cleaner and more professional. You don't want it cleaner and more professional then you want it more like what you have, but like it's hard to describe. So just beware of demoitis because demoitis is, uh, you just want it back to where the demo was. And, and bands have a lot of this where they make a demo of a song before they go into the studio and then they go into the studio to record it. And then they find that, the way they played things or the parts or whatever are different and they don't like it anymore because it's not what the original demo was. So beware of that. And, and I, I think, yes, absolutely. You have to, you have to listen to the song and understand what you're doing, but don't over listen to it. The point that you are so in love with it or you don't understand and, and listening to it back to back to back with the uh, mix as it comes in, you need to give yourself some space so that you can appreciate what they did and the better sounding mix, appreciate what that better sounding mix is giving you. Um, so yeah, just be aware of that as you're working on a song. Don't, don't, and, and on a mix specifically is, is beware of demoitis and understand that. Y yeah. Once you get the real mix, you should probably be listening to the real mix, not the demo or the old mix. Uh, unless you're like, there's a part missing or there's something missing that I really liked that I had, but as an overall mix, you have to let it go a little bit, you know? <laughs> so, um, otherwise don't get it mixed and just use the rough mix or something like that or sit beside the mixer and go, well, it just needs to be a little bit better. Um, but you're still going to be paying them the full rate. So, you know, you can do that. Absolutely. You can do that, but beware about that. Next is all things are relative. When you say to a mixer to move something, when you give them mix notes and you say the vocal needs to be louder or the vocal needs to be this, or the guitar needs to be louder or this. And then your next thing is, well, you know, yeah, I like the vocal, but I can't hear the guitar now. And then they're like, okay, great. Here's the guitar. Okay. Well now I can't hear the drums. Okay. And they bring the drums up. Okay. Well now I can't hear the bass. Okay. You bring the bass up. Okay. Now I can't hear the vocals. It's all relative. It is all relative. And mixers are good ones are good at knowing how to balance this and good at knowing uh, how to make everything heard. And that's part of where the creative decisions come in is how do you make everything heard without kind of jumping all over everything else? And how do you use effects and how do you use EQ to do that? So beware that to make things work, to make, to make the whole song work, to make the whole mix work, to make all the layers that you've given the mixer work, uh, you're, there are going to be compromises, frankly, where it's like, well, not everything can be super large sounding. And then uh, it just, it, there's not enough room, you know? Um, and this is where I find a lot of that demo stuff comes in where it's like, everything's large, but not everything, but I can't really hear anything, but I want it to sound like that where everything's large, but I need it more professional sounding. Well, the professional sounding thing is where it's not going to be all large and everything has its place. And that's what's going to make the whole mix speak and be able to actually hear everything versus your demo where you can hear it because you know the elements in there, but the average person is just going to hear a muddy mess. Okay. Um, so, <laughs> you know, 
but but remember in a mix scenario when you say a certain note when you give them a note of bring something up or change this or do whatever some other things are going to happen that is not the mixer's fault they are doing exactly what you asked them to do but there are repercussions for every move as soon as you eq something differently other things have room to speak or other things have room to show or get masked now more because of the eq move that you did so just remember that everything's relative and every note you do, there are going to be, uh, I wouldn't say consequences, but there are repercussions to that. So just be aware of that. And that's not the mixer's fault. That is just the nature of literally of physics. That is physics. <laughs> okay. Um, and then the last note that I have is when it's done, it's done. Okay. When it's done, it is done. When you sign off on it, just realize that it's done and you can move on. This is a snapshot. Like I said, this mix and this song and this production is a snapshot of that part of your life. When you finally say, you know what, this is done. That's good. Move on. At a certain point, you have to, you have to call it done. Uh, at a certain point, you have to be happy with it and, and, and move on from it because we can change things forever. And the longer that it takes, the more it's going to be uh, a different, you're going to hear it differently because it's taken so long that you're in a different place creatively and you can change things forever. You really, really can. And it's really important to realize that at a certain point you have to say it's done and you have to stop worrying about it. You have to stop. And sometimes that is literally don't listen to it for a while and, and then come back to it and just accept the fact that it's done. You've paid for it. It's mastered. It's finished. It's done. Um, you know, uh, adding 0.5 of a DB on the vocal at that point is not going to change the song. It's not going to make or break the mix. You've already done the legwork of it. Um, leave it to the mixer in the process to, to do the 0.5 and 0.2 dB moves. Adding 0.2 dB at 3.5 K is not going to make or break the mix anymore. It's done. Okay. Uh, and, and I, I, you got to move on at a certain point <laughs> and mix notes. This is why mix notes to take too long are not good because you've not, you're never going to, you're, you have a hard time accepting that it's done at that point. And some people just don't want to accept that it's done, but you have to. And the beautiful part about doing that as a creator, as a artist is once you accept something is done and you can move on from it, then get, get this, get this. Once you move on and it's done, you can then move on to creating your next creation. You can work on your next song and then you can pour your new snapshot of life, your new creative, uh, thoughts into that one. Lots of bands love their old records and there's equally amount of bands that go, Oh man, I really wish that was better. But at that point in my life, I really liked it. And so you're always, there's always mixed, mixed feelings when you look back at old work, whether you love it or whether you hate it or whether you wish it was different, you're always going to think that. So at a certain point you call it done. And at a certain point you move on and go on to your next creation and just keep iterating and keep growing on your further creations, on your further songs, on the further, on the next mixes, all that kind of stuff. Because that is, frankly, the whole creation thing that we do in engineering and mixing, in songwriting, we're continually growing, we're continually improving, and that is a beautiful, beautiful thing, but you need to move on from something to be able to accept something different. It's like a relationship. If you break up with somebody, you got to move on from them to find the next person. You can't be pining over them and still find your next love. Okay. Um, it's the same thing with songs. At a certain point you have to accept and close it and go, you know what? That is done. That is where I was at that point at making this record. And I'm happy with it. I'm happy enough with it that I can move on and go on to the next one. And anything that I want to try or that I want to do, I'm going to incorporate into this song, that octave pedal that I am now playing with live. I'm going to put in the new song, not the old one. Um, so yeah, when it's done, it's done. So hopefully that helped. I'm just going to run through these these uh, real quick uh, just to recap what we talked about. So first off, mixed notes shouldn't take very long. To me, to me they shouldn't take much more than two weeks, frankly. Uh, number two is listening in environments that you know. Listen on headphones that you know. Listen in the car that you know and listen on the speakers that you know. Don't try and find a gazillion different places to listen. Listen 
a couple times, a few times on the things that you already know and make your kind of your gut instinct notes. Next is don't bring in too many cooks to the kitchen. Don't send it to your brother and your buddy and your mother and your everybody in the band's buddy and brother and mother and girlfriend and girlfriend's best friend and all this kind of stuff. Too many cooks, too many different opinions. You're going to get confused and it's going to confuse the mixer, especially if you can't even keep track of it. So, uh, yeah, just too many cooks is not a good idea. It's your creation. You need to be happy with it. Not your buddy, Johnny's brother. Okay. (laughs) So, um, I'm racking on a, a Johnny name right now, but anywho, um, next as a band, consolidate your notes, talk as a band, and then send those notes to the mixer, hash out the problems that you guys have in between yourselves before sending it to a mixer and send one consolidated master list of the notes that you've already talked about so that the drummer's notes don't contradict the guitar player's notes, uh, because then you're just going to get an annoyed engineer. (laughs) Okay. Um, next is if you, uh, if you have questions, uh, on something that your mixer did ask them, communication, just ask them and they'll probably have a reason and they'll explain it to you. So make sure you communicate with them. Next, you're hiring a mixer for their creativity. So accept their creativity, let them be creative, let them do their thing and see what they can offer to your song. Next, be aware of demo-itis. Uh, and I don't really, you know, there's a million ways to combat this. Some people need to listen to their songs a million different times, but I personally think listen to it enough, but not too much that you're super attached to the track. So just be aware of that. That's a thing. And that maybe you have it demoitis. I've had people that say, I don't know about this move, but I, I trust you. And I know that I have demo. I, I, I love the original. So I'm going to trust you that this is better, uh, because right now I don't have that perspective. And, and frankly, it's just space. You need to step back from a mix as an artist, you need to step back from the demo to give the new mix a chance because chances are it's better and it will work better. (laughs) Um, not always, not always. I will say not always, but it's a good chance. Um, next, all things are relative. When you say a note, it's something else is going to change in the mix. So your everything is relative. This is why mix notes can happen. This is why as a mixer, you're always changing different things. And then you have to go back and fix something else and fix something else and everything, because everything has, uh, repercussions in other aspects of the mix, something that you might not even think about, but it's a, it's a thing. So when you give mix notes, know that something else might happen. It's not the mixer's fault. It's the repercussion of the mix note that you gave them for better or for worse. Okay. Uh, but th- everything is relative. And then finally to end it off when it's done, it is done. Actually be able to like try to move on at a certain point. You're making notes that are so small. No one's ever going to hear it. And it's just a waste of energy. Move on to the next creation and just when the song is done, it's done. Don't try and revisit it in a year. Give it time uh, and call it done and move on and move on to your next creations. So hopefully that helps. Hopefully that gives you some ideas for mix notes and from uh, gives you some perspective, frankly, into what to expect in mix notes and what to deal with in mix notes. I think I might do a follow up episode about actually delivering notes and how to deliver mix notes to a mixer specifically. I've done feedback. I've talked about feedback, uh, but I think it needs we need to talk about specifically mix notes a bit more in depth. So uh, I might do a, a follow up episode on that sometime in the near future so keep an eye out for that so thank you guys so much for listening or watching on youtube if that's where you are you can go over to the youtube channel and leave a comment or on my website you can go to anacreates.ca slash podcast and find all the episodes there and leave a comment let me know what you think if you have any notes as a mixer as an engineer uh, or as an artist uh, about this um, leave a comment on any of my podcasts there you can listen to them you can find the show notes for them there uh, some are more in depth than others and but leave your comments leave your thoughts leave your opinions I'm always open to different thoughts and opinions uh, from any of this. And and we're all helping each other, frankly. So anything else that you can add to the conversation, uh, I love it. So thank you guys again for listening. I will see you in the next episode. Until then, always be creating. (laughs) 